Hi, everyone. Good evening. I hope you're all doing well during these difficult times. In this lecture, I discuss some of the most salient literary and scholarly writings published by the propagandists in the late 19th century. Some of these writings are familiar to us because its reading has been made compulsory in school, but some of them remain obscure and forgotten. These writings, as Priscilla Mujeres argues, comprise the modern knowledge the Illustratus produced and was determinative in the creation of a national consciousness and in the rise of Philippine nationalism. My lecture for tonight is titled Illustratus Scholarship and the Production of Modern Knowledge from 1881 to 1891. In order to fully understand the writings of the Illustrados, we have to go back to the context or the background of the propaganda in Spain. As mentioned by Rizil Mujeres in his book, Brains of the Nation, there were two associations that were leading the movement in the late 1880s until the early 1890s. And uh, these were, the first one was the Asociación Hispano-Filipino, which was based in Madrid. And the second one was the Asociación La Solidaridad, which was based in Barcelona. The first association was led by the Spaniard, Mason, and liberal Miguel Moraita. He was a professor of history at the Universidad Complutense de Madrid. He was joined by several Filipino students who were also studying in the said city. Most notably, you have there Antonia Luna and Dominador Gomez. They were officials of the Asociación and other Filipino members also a partook in the said association. La Solidaridad was the other one, which was based in Barcelona. It was inaugurated on December 31st, 1888, and Graciano Lopez Jaina was elected president, while Jose Rizal, who was at the time in London annotating Morga Sucesos de los Islas Filipinas, was appointed honorary president of the said association. It is very important to understand what was the campaign all about. In an article titled Philippine Aspirations published on the April 30th issue of La Solidaridad, the Illustrados outlined three things in their campaign. First and foremost, of course, was the representation to the Spanish Cortes. At this point of their campaign, they were trying to seek equal rights, political rights that is, for Filipinos and that Filipinos be regarded as co-equal of Spaniards. The second was the abolition of censorship. As mentioned by Rizil Mujeres in Brains of the Nation, there had been committees of censorship that were established in the Philippines in the late 19th century. You will also remember that in 1887, when the Noli Mitangere was published and it first arrived the shores of Manila, the University of Santo Tomas commissioned a censorship committee that was led by Dominican friars. And of course, they censored the Noli Mitangere and did not allow the circulation of the book in the Philippines. Finally, they were also against the banishing of residents purely on the basis of administrative orders and without sentence from the judicial power. So if you've heard of the term destiero, they were completely against it and they want uh, the Spanish government to have a clear and decisive prohibition on the practice of estiero or banishment. So these campaigns were outlined in an article titled Philippine Aspirations. It was also mentioned in the letters of Marcelo del Pilar because this was a petition that they sent to the Minister of Overseas Colonies who at that time was Manuel Becerra who like Moraita was a liberal and was also a Spanish Mason and therefore was sympathetic to the Philippine cause. In their campaign for representation to the Spanish Cortes, the Ilustrados had to prove and establish that they are from a civilized race and that the Philippines is worthy of assimilation to Spain. But what constituted this quote unquote imagined community? Later, we will find out through and with the help of Filomeno V. Aguilar Jr.'s essay, Tracing Origins. Vestil Mujeres argues that the Illustrados co-opted literature, ethnology, philology, and folklore, having seen the need to create an archive of knowledge on the Philippines and its peoples. 
The next few slides will be figures of book covers which were written and published by the Ilustrados in the late 19th century. The first figure is Pedro Paterno's book of poems titled Sampaguitas. It was published in Madrid in 1881. According to Father John Schumacher, this was the first conscious beginning of Filipino literature. He says, and I quote, the initial step was represented by Pedro Paterno's slight book of verses, Sampaguitas. Neither in its first edition nor in the subsequent and large editions will we find more than mediocre lyrics. They are not great literature nor even good, but their significance is in the fact that this was the first conscious attempt to create a Filipino literature, end quote. This extract was actually taken from Father Schumacher's book, The Making of a Nation, published in 1991. It was not as good as the Noli or the Fili, but its greatest contribution was that it was the beginning and a conscious attempt in creating a Filipino literature. The second figure is more familiar to us because this has been made compulsory and we might have read this from our junior high school years, grade nine, uh, grade 10, we read the sequel, El Filibusterismo. But the first of those two novels was titled No Limit Angere. It was published in 1887 in Berlin. And there had been several editions that followed after Rizal died in 1896. So the figure that you see on your screens is actually a third edition, which was published a few years after Rizal was executed in Bagumbayan. And the Noli Mitangere was very important because it represented the very first uh, organized and that uh, unveiled manner of campaign and propaganda in Spain. Before that, before 1887, the Ilustrados would normally write and they would sign it using their nom de plume or pseudonyms. But beginning with the Noli Mitangere, Rizal was one of the first Ilustrados to sign it with his complete name, Jose Rizal. And he claimed the authorship of this book, No Limit Angere. As I mentioned earlier, it was censored in Manila. It was banned. Its circulation uh, became a crime. It was deemed heretic and dangerous to the Spanish state, as uh, argued by the commission that censored the novel. Moreover, according to Father Schumacher, the Noli Mitangere was a scathing, full-scale indictment of the Philippine political and religious regime. But Rizal's book was more than a mere attack on the existing Philippine establishment because it was a proclamation of the gospel of Filipino nationalism, a call to the regeneration of the Philippine people. You will also notice here that the Noli Mitangere did not just assail the Spanish colonial government or the friars, but it also assailed, for example, the Principalia. There's a chapter in the Tagalog version or in the Filipino version that says, mga nagahari-harian, no? sina Kapitan Thiago, yung mga Donya. Kapwa Pilipino pinupuna ni Jose Rizal sa nobelang ito. Kahit yung pagsasabong o kaya yung pagkalulong ng mga Pilipino sa pagsusugal ay pinupuna ni Rizal sa nobelang ito. So Noli Mitangere did not only serve as Rizal's critique against the Spanish colonial government, against the Catholic Church, but it was also a critique against the Filipinos who were reigning supreme in the colony as if they are the colonizers. The third figure that you see on your screen is Antonio Luna's Impressions. Now these essays were actually Luna's uh, travel essays or reminiscence of the city of Madrid. Originally, it was published between 1889 to 1891 in the pages of La Solidaridad. And according to Raquel Reyes, it was a series of vignettes of Madrid life that chronicled the disenchantment that Luna felt and which many of his compatriots shared when they contrasted the realities of Spanish life with the idealized image propagated by Spaniards in the Philippines. I think some contextual notes are in order. First, the Spaniards who were apologists and who were journalists at the same time, they wrote 
about the Philippines and they were saying that it was uncivilized, that it was unsophisticated. And on the other hand, they portrayed Madrid as an ideal city. They portrayed an ideal image of Madrid in the Philippines. Now, when Luna and the other ilustrados arrived in Spain, they encountered Madrid and even Barcelona. They felt disenchanted because the Madrid they encountered was not what was portrayed to them by the Spanish apologists. Some of them uh, were Pedro Canyamaque, Pablo Fesed, who was uh, more known as Kyokyap. Kyokyap. And then there was also Mirdea, Celso Mirdea, who was uh, an enemy of Antonio Luna. So the Impressionists documented Antonio Luna's encounters in Madrid, not just with the city, but also with its people, men and women alike. Mostly his encounter with women was documented in the Impressionists. It was published in Madrid, the collection, in 1891. 1891. The fourth figure, which you see on your screens, is Trinidad Pardo de Tavera's Contribución para el Estudio de los Antiguos Alfabetos Filipinos. Now, this was a linguistic treatise on the Philippines, and uh, it was published in Lausanne in 1884. And we have to take note at this point that Pardo de Tavera was not just a medical doctor, but he was a trained and professional linguist as well. So he published several books on uh, the Philippine languages. So according to Rizil Mujares, um, Pardo argues in the Contribución that contrary to what Spanish accounts assume or suggest, Filipino writing was neither anomalous nor unintelligible, but had its proper and logical form. Again, we go back to the Spanish apologists who would normally uh, suggest or assume or argue that the Baibayan, for instance, was rudimentary. It was uncivilized. It was nothing compared to the Latin alphabet. Some Dominican friars deemed that it was not fit or it could not have translated the faith to the Filipinos or to the natives living in the archipelago. So that's the reason why they uh, replaced the Baibayin with the Latin alphabet. But the thing is, part of the Tavera acknowledged the fact that it was also the Filipinos' choice to abandon the Baibayin because they bought the idea that it was far more superior. The Latin alphabet was far more superior than the Baibayin. Uh, to be honest, even Padre Tavera and Jose Rizal, they were not really campaigning that we revert to the Baibayin because it's no longer standard and practical. So we see here the ambivalence of uh, some of the illustrators, particularly Rizal. Uh, on the one hand, he's campaigning that, yeah, we have our own alphabet, we had our own system of writing, but he was not totally campaigning for its use or for us to revert to it in the 19th century. So we also see there that these illustrados were discursively complicit to the discourses of the West. They bought the idea that the Latin alphabet is standard and more superior than the Baibayin. So these are some ambivalences and contradictions that we see in the work of the Illustrados. Figure number five is another book published by Trinidad Padre de Tavera. And in this book titled El Sanscrito in la Lengua Tagalog, Pardo de Tavera documents the influence of Sanskrit uh, or the language of the Indians to our own language here in the Philippines. He lists down 33 Tagalog words, sorry, 303 Tagalog words, and he indicates their Sanskrit equivalent, the notation, phonetic properties, and equivalent or analogous words in other Philippine languages. So what Pardo de Tavera was trying to show in this work was that we were already civilized and we already had our interactions with our neighboring Asian empires or countries before Spanish colonization came. So we already had our trading patterns, we already had our relations, we already had our language influenced by another group of people. So that was El Sanskrito and La Lengua Tagalog. 
I did not mention at the onset, but not only did the Illustrados co-opt or appropriate uh, the fields of disciplines that I mentioned, like literature, ethnology, language, philology, etc. But they also co-opted sports in order to assert that they too were modern men, that they too were civilized enough, and that they deserve assimilation to Spain. So sports was also part of their propaganda to show their Spanish counterparts that they too were modern. So if you take a look at the picture you see in the middle, Jose Rizal, and you see here to your right, I believe this is Juan Luna, and they were uh, playing fencing. They were playing fencing. I believe this was in Paris. And they were also playing uh, pistol shooting aside from fencing. Rizal had his um, routine. He was doing weightlifting. He was even encouraging his sisters back in Calamba to do the same, to maintain a, a regular physical routine, uh, just to uh, be healthy. So we see there the Jesuit influence in, in Rizal's uh, philosophy, you know, the sound mind and the sound body. According to Raquel Reyes, it was also seen in the way they dressed in their sartorial style. So take a look at their top hats, their canes, the way they groom their mustache, their overcoats. You will see there a highly westernized image of um, the propagandists in Madrid. I believe this picture was taken in 1890. Uh, so you see here Rizal, and this is Marcelo del Pilar. The others, there's too many to mention. We'll have to identify them uh, another time. But tonight, I'd like to focus more on ethnology. Uh, this was the focus of Dr. Filomeno V. Aguilar Jr.'s essay, Tracing Origins. One influential intellectual or thinker in the 19th century was Ferdinand Blumenthal. And as we all know, he corresponded with Rizal. And he also maintained correspondences with the editors and writers of La Solidaridad. For example, Del Pilar, Jose Maria Panganiban, and Graciano Lopez Heine. In 1882, he published a book titled Versuch einer Ethnographie den Philippinen. It's written in German, where he postulated that the peoples of the Philippines are constituted of three migrant waves. Now, this is something that we learned from grade, from, from grade school, sorry. And we have learned that uh, there were three groups who came to the Philippines. The first, of course, were the Negritos, and then followed by the Indones, or who uh, Blumenthal regarded as the invading Malayans. And finally, we have the second invading Malayans, or the Malays, simply called the Malays. So you see here the cover of the book, so it's written in German, as I mentioned. Many thanks to the National Library of Spain for making this available for us. And this was the table of contents. This is the table of contents. And you will see here the different ethno-linguistic groups were uh, living in the Philippines. So, inisa-isaya ni Blumenbrit sa kanyang aklat na versu. Now, let's go back to the migration wave theory. Now, Blumenbrit posited that the Negritos constituted the first wave of migrants. He referred to them as the natives, who are of black complexion, barbarians of trifling mental capacity, and with no fixed settlements. They were dangerous, and because they pillaged the settlements of the other natives, they were, of course, uh, dangerous to uh, the Indios. Later on, I'm going to talk something, talk, talk more about the Indios. Now, the second wave of migrants was made up of the first invading Malayans, or uh, to use the term used by H. Oatley Bayer, they were called the Indones or the Indonesians, the so second wave of migrants to the Philippines. Now, uh, Blumenthal referred to them simply as the mountain tribes. So yung mga descendants nila, yung mga naninirahan ngayon sa Cordillera. You have there the Igorots, Gaos, Apayaos, you have the Zambals, you have the Apakas, Kalingas, uh, Ginanons, saka yung mga Ilongots, the headhunting Ilongots of Nueva Vizcaya. 
So they were the ones who retreated to the mountains because they didn't accept the uh, the new political and social order that was organized by the Spanish colonial government. If you will remember the reduction, many of them did not accept the new political order. No? So they retreated to the mountains, uh, yung mga remontados, yung mga cimarrones, uh, sila yon, yung mga hindi nagpabinyag at yung mga hindi educated ng Spanish colonial government. Now, the second invading Malayans constituted the third wave of migrants to the Philippines. According to Blumenfried, these were the Hispanized populations in the lowlands of Luzon and Visayas. Furthermore, they possessed a higher level of civilization and milder morals compared to the first Malay wave. So medyo makikita natin dito yung racism, yung racial undertones sa theory ni Ferdinand Blumenfried. Kasi yung assumption dito ay paganda ng paganda yung lahi na dumating sa Pilipinas. Na yung morals nila ay mas bumuti habang uh, tumatagal ano? at habang uh, yung, yung malays na yung pinaka-civilized for them, at least according to, to Blumenfried. And later, the Ilustrados will also adopt that idea. So sino ba yung mga second invading Malayans? Sila yung mga Tagalog, yung mga Bisaya, yung mga Bicolano, Pangan, Ilocano, and all the other major ethno-linguistic groups in the Philippines. So the Spaniards referred to them simply as the Indios. Sila yung mga tumanggap doon sa bagong socio-political order pagkatapos ng reduksyon. Now, the Ilustrados adopted these ideas. In search of lost origins or an ancient Filipino civilization or uh, Los Antiguo Filipino, the Ilustrados appropriated the salient ethnological ideas by Blumenfield. Some examples that I could share with you are uh, Pedro Paterno's books titled La Antigua Civilización Tagalog, published in 1887 and Los Itas, which was published in 1890. Jose Rizal's annotations to Morga and uh, his Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas was also, or is also a good example to our discussion tonight. So 1890 naman, na ilimbag yung uh, annotations ni Rizal kay Morga. So figure six will show you the cover of the book, Las, uh, sorry, Los Itas, published in Madrid, 1890. Figure 7, you will see here Paternos La Antigua Civilización Tagalog, 1887, it was published in Madrid. You will notice here that Paterno claims that he is a descendant of a Maginoo family in Manila, no? Maginoo Paterno, yung nakalagay sa cover ng kanya. And finally, figure eight, you will see here the cover of Rizal's annotations to Morgas Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, published in Paris in 1890. And you will also see here in the cover that Professor Blumenfried was the one who wrote the uh, introduction, the preface of the book. And Blumenfried was not all praises of the book. He criticized Rizal for his, uh, for his anachronism anachronism because he uh, examined the categories of the 16th century using the wider lenses and horizons of the 19th century. So according to Blumenfried, that uh, kind of examination was anachronistic. Isabella de los Reyes was also critical of the book. It actually resulted to an argument between uh, him and Rizal in La Solidaridad. So, uh, I'm not sure kung anong taon yun, pero may mga artikulo sa La Solidaridad na nagsagutan lang si Rizal at si De Los Reyes. You know? They were criticizing uh, their viewpoints, each other's viewpoints. Now, going back to illustrative scholarship, the recurring theme in the books that I just mentioned is this. The Negritos were not included in their imagined community, in the signifier Filipino or whom the Ilustrados regarded as Filipinos. Because the Negritos were deemed uh, primitive, wild, nomadic, and therefore uncivilized. This is coming from the Ilustrados now. And this is no longer Blumenfried uh, speaking. 
Now, the first group of Malayans were not included as well because of their supposed, quote-unquote, racial contamination of the Negritos. Because some of them, if not most of them, intermarried with the Negritos. The third migration wave were the ones who were deemed Filipinos and that they were civilized and therefore assimilable to Spain. So the Ilustrados only regarded the third migration wave as the Filipinos, no? as the Filipinos who are worthy of assimilation to Spain. They did not include the first two migration waves, the Philippines. The primitive, primitive races, the first and second migration waves, for example, were reckoned as hindrances in the campaign for assimilation and representation of the Cortes. Because according to Graciano Lopez Haina, they overshadowed the Indios and conveyed that the Philippines had not reached the stage of enlightenment that would merit the concession of political rights. Maalala natin yung encuentro ni Luna sa Madrid na may nakasalubong siyang babae. The woman cried out and exclaimed loudly, ay ke horror um igorote. Maalala natin yung reaction ni Antonio Luna. He was not happy with what the woman said. And he did not identify himself as an igorote, which at least according to this literature was part of uh, the second wave of uh, migrants to the Philippines. So hindi na appreciate ni Luna yon. He saw that as an insult. So isang magandang halimbawa yon sinasabi ni Lopez Haina na isang malaking balakid o kaya hadlang yung mga primitive races sa kanilang kampanya. So again, we see here a contradiction and a ambivalence on the part of the illustrators. On the one hand, they would allude, they would study, they would present the pre-colonial past of the Philippines, but they would eschew the natives on the other, especially the first two uh, migrants to the Philippines, the, the first and second migration waves. So that's another ambivalence no, or form of contradiction in the works of, for example, Viterno and Jose Rizal. Now, according to Filomeno Aguilar Jr. in his uh, article, Tracing Origins, the Illustrados' imagined community was restricted to the already lowland, uh, sorry, colonized lowland inhabitants of third wave ancestry, those whom Spain had designated as Itios. Hindi kasama doon yung mga mountain tribes, hindi kasama yung mga negritos, at mas lalong hindi kasama doon yung mga Muslim sa Mindanao because they saw Mindanao as uh, a rival state in the south. Diba? You would remember the Sultanate of Sulu and you would also remember the Sultanate of Maguindanao. Sila yung mga uh, kalaban ng Espanya sa Mindanao. Now, the term Filipino race was actually racist because it only applied to the Indios who were deemed assimilable and civilizable. Again, nakikita natin yung racial undertones. We see here... Uh, the discursive complicity of the illustrados to the discourses of, for example, racism and colonialism. Western discourses, you know, they're very much complicit to these things. And finally, the Filipinos stood for the internally superior and dominant race led by an enlightened class whose members, although charged as inferior by racist outsiders, were equal to Europeans. So makikita natin dito na nilalabanan nga nila yung racism laban sa yung mga Spanish apologists. No? Pero sila naman, yung pagtrato ng mga ilustrados na to sa first and second migration wave, makikita natin na complicit sila dun sa racism. No? And they, they're actually personifications of the violences of uh, colonialism. No? The writings that these ilustrados produce. Now, despite these limitations, we also have to acknowledge that one of the accomplishments of the propaganda movement was the creation of a nationalist consciousness among the Filipinos. It made Filipinos aware that they had a pre-colonial past, they had their own system of writing, they had their own poetry, songs, and a pristine culture, to say the least. It also gave rise to Philippine nationalism, particularly the long revolution that ensued, and uh, that revolution lasted from 1896 
until after Aguinaldo had surrendered to the Americans, it went on. And primarily, it was influenced by the scholarship of these illustrados, despite the limitations. We also acknowledge their accomplishments. To conclude, I'd like to share with you two extracts from Rizil Mujares and Father John Schumacher regarding the propaganda. The first passage is from Brains of the Nation. Rizil Mujares says that the production of modern knowledge by Filipinos was determinative in the rise of Philippine nationalism. In the late 19th century, Filipinos, increasingly self-aware in their nationality, started to lay the local foundations of disciplines, such as history, anthropology, linguistics, political science, and sociology. Filipinos were engaged in cultural self-definition in the context of anti-colonial nation formation. The movement carried on until after Rizal, Del Pilar, and Lopez Haina, and even Panganiban had died in the 1890s. It proceeded, it continued with the generation of the likes of, for example, uh, Epifanio de los Santos, who is an under or who was uh, a historian and remains to be an obscure figure in Philippine history. Epifanio de los Santos. We just remember him because the most dreaded avenue in the Philippines was named after him. Finally, this was uh, written by Father John Schumacher in 1997 in his book, The Propaganda. And he said, this was the accomplishment of the propaganda movement. to have brought to the awareness of the Filipino people that they were a nation with a common heritage and a common destiny. Today, by vested of the historical circumstances in which it arose, the propaganda movement remains at the heart of the Filipino nationalism, for it was these ideals which built the nation. 